Okay. Hey, Tom Moran here, doing something a little bit different this time. Instead of just having the whole talking hands thing going with my video, I'm going to appear on screen for a little bit. This feature is going to be about piece Letharium. So instead of just focusing on a specific species, we're just going to look at the entire genus. Part of the issue is this is a species where there's a lot of misinformation out there. They're very popular, but people are also very scared of them. I do a lot of piece Letharium videos, and I've gotten a lot of comments that they're kind of like the devil spider. They're very, very dangerous, and I want to kind of dispel some of that. Um, it's an amazing species. When I did my top 10 species or top five species of old worlds, this was the one I picked as my number one because I absolutely love the genus. For me, they're almost like a step above most tarantulas. One of the reasons is they're beautiful. So if we look over here, we see a picture of Pisa Letharia metallica. This one is uh, very, very sought after, mostly by people that are new to the hobby because it's one of the first blue spiders they see. But as much as they are sought after for the fact they're beautiful, they're also feared because of their supposed defensive or skittish attitudes, and above all, their incredibly potent venom. So what we're gonna do now is break down their care, some of the misconceptions about them, some of the ways I keep them, which is absolutely different than how other people keep them, and hopefully people will be more informed at the end of this video, and maybe some people who have some experience under their belt will give them a try. So let's move on to the actual video. Large lith sleek arboreals. Peace Lathera species are widely recognized for their gorgeous fractile patterns that actually help them camouflage themselves in the wild. They are known by the common names parachute spiders, tiger tarantulas, or ornamental tarantulas, and they hail from India and Sri Lanka. Unfortunately, the majority of species are endangered or critically endangered due to human encroachment and the destruction of their habitats. In the case of the species Peace Lathera hanumavalisa mica and metallica, some suspect that there are only hundreds left in the wild, which is incredibly sad to think about. Fortunately, these species are readily available in the hobby and easily bred. So even as the numbers tend to dwindle in the wild, we can at least take solace in the fact that they will continue to exist for years to come in our collections. Not ideal, but better than them disappearing from the face of the earth. These spiders are nocturnal, and in the wild, they would emerge at nighttime from their dens. They're usually created in cracks and crevices and tree barks and where branches intersect, and sometimes at the base of trees to hunt. They'd eat insects, and in some cases, a stray bird or even bat, and they're incredibly fast. Part of that's due to the fact that they're arboreal and have to snatch things out of the air. I've personally seen mine grab crickets from out of the air, and it's incredibly impressive to witness. Although a lot of online care sheets tend to try to depict the husbandry for these guys for being rather difficult, it's very, very simple. And of all the species of spiders I keep, I found Pisa Letharia to be one of the hardiest, even as slings. Setup-wise, I start them all in 32-ounce deli cups with a couple inches of substrate moist and cork barks. And here we'll see one of them hiding behind the cork bark. Now, whether you use a cork bark flat or cork bark round is up to you. Just know if you use a round, you won't see your spider very much because they will retreat into them. It very much emulates what they have in the wild. I also throw in some sphagnum moss and allow them to use it to create dirt curtains. A lot of them will web up the area behind the cork bark and create a little hide for themselves with webbing, dirt, and moss. I do keep them moist as slings, but I'm not obsessive about it. And I also include water dishes with all of them. I also like to use cross ventilation. I don't ventilate the top and that helps to trap in a little bit of the humidity that would be evaporating otherwise. It's important to note that although this is an arboreal species, a lot of arboreals will burrow as slings and in some cases juveniles and up to adulthood. So don't be surprised if your new sling digs, builds itself a little burrow and acts a little bit fossorial to start off. Here we have one of my Pisa Letharia vitatas about to hunt. I'm glad I caught this one on video. These guys are amazing hunters and will start taking down prey as large as themselves once they hit about an inch and a half or so. I found that the smaller slings are a little bit more skittish and afraid of larger prey, but once they put on a little size, one and a quarter to one and a half inches or so, you can pretty much drop a full large cricket in there and they will take it down. Excellent eaters all around, one of the best eaters I have of any species, and probably my best eating arboreal species. And with good eating comes fast growth rate. Don't be surprised if your one inch sling hits three and a half, four inches within the first year. Mine grow very, very quickly, even kept at temperatures in the 70s. Um, here we have a juvenile setup for one. For juveniles, you want to keep in mind that they're not going to be in here very much if you do a juvenile setup or for very long. So you want something that offers very easy access specifically 
for the rehousing. So I usually pick something around a gallon, two gallons. I suggest something with an open top that you can get into easily. And as far as the actual setup, same way as a sling enclosure, and I only moisten down the substrate occasionally. Now, as this is such a fast growing species, one of the things you can do is limit the number of rehouses you have to do and skip the juvenile setup. So what you would do is let your sling hit about three and a half inches or so, and then put it directly into one of these, your adult setup. Now, what about my enclosures? They're obviously a little bit different from what you normally see for an arboreal. They do offer the height, but more importantly, I can go in from the top. They offer me a lot of space to work, and I prefer that for pokies because when they get startled, they tend to circle. So a front opening enclosure is going to offer them a way to escape. I like to go in from the top and have lots of room to work. Here's what I was using for my enclosures, but as you can see, it's a little bit milky, not very attractive. I've now switched over to, in the upper corner there, the extra large exoterras. Also, Exoterra nanos would be good or some of their enclosures or your typical arboreal enclosures that are tall and thin. For an adult, you want something in the 5 to 10 gallon range, closer to 10 for an Anata and Rufalata due to their max sizes. And you don't have to worry so much about keeping them moist. I keep mine with open water dishes and occasionally wet down some of the substrate on one side or their cork bark and they do fine and it gets very dry in my home during the winter time. Temperament-wise, I think these guys kind of get a bad rep. Although slings can be very, very skittish, the adults tend to be more shy and will try to hide when their enclosure is disturbed. Although Ornata and Rufalata do have a reputation for being a bit more defensive. Some things you can do to make your life easier is just tap the enclosure a couple times before you open, which will allow them to settle down a bit. And if your tarantula ever becomes spooked, leave it alone, back off, and come back again later. Personally, I find species like Tapanakinius and Salmopius to be much more skittish and defensive and prone to bite. So again, I think a lot of this is a bad rep, more due to the potential of what they can do if they bite. And we'll get into that in just about two seconds. So one of the things that is an issue with them is their venom potency. And here we're going to go over some of just generalizations. A new world species bite is not particularly bad. This is your typical bite that is akin to a beer wuss sting. You may get some localized swelling and redness, some pain for a little while, but it'll go away. Old world baboon species, medically significant, excruciating pain that can travel up the limb, cramping, lightheadedness, nausea, effects can last several days. Not a pleasant bite and something you don't want. Now, Pisolotheria species, much more powerful bite. Pain lasts for hours. Excruciating pain, medicine won't touch it. Full body cramping, breathing issues, chest pains, and heart palpitations can be an issue. And issues can reoccur for months, if up to a year. And this is where I think the fear comes from. Bottom line, this is not a spider you want to be bitten by. It's going to lead to a trip to the hospital. Elderly folks, children, or people with pre-existing medical conditions could also have further complications. So you really don't want to get bitten. The good news is they're not very prone to bite. And in a study about bites from Pisolotheria species, it was found that about half of them were dry bites. So this isn't a spider that's looking to hurt you. It should also be mentioned that bites are not going to be deadly. There is not any evidence that they can kill you. However, it is going to put quite the hurting on you. Although Pisolotheria species do possess that scary combination of speed and potent venom, I do not find them particularly defensive. I don't think it's an inevitability that somebody that keeps Pisolotheria species is going to get bitten. In fact, I think bites should be incredibly rare if a keeper is experienced and careful. I hear a lot of keepers that say, well, I'm just going to get bit, it's going to happen, and those are generally the ones that haven't worked around spiders very long. If you're careful and conscientious, there shouldn't be an issue. And of course, the spot where you are going to run into situations where you could get bit by your spider and when things could go wrong are during rehousings. So before getting one of these, you want to make sure you have your basic husbandry down as well as your transfers. Be practice, have them down to a science, have an area where you can work. If it's a bathtub, keep in mind they can climb the walls. That's a fallacy that they can't. They might go a bit more slowly, but they can get up them, so don't be surprised there. And stay calm during the rehousings. You want a situation where you stay calm, you work slowly, and the spider remains calm. If while rehousing the spider becomes spooked and starts to bolt, close the lid, back away, and come back later. There's no use in dealing with a spider that's been jacked up. That's a good spot to get bitten. You can always leave the catch cup in if the spider's not coming out of it. Let it come out on its own. There's nothing wrong with that. And try to be careful when blowing or spraying on a spider because it doesn't take much to set them off. You do not want the tarantula becoming defensive because it's scared. You want it to remain calm. 
Now, personally speaking, I can definitely understand some of the fear and apprehension that can come when keepers decide to keep Pizzolotheria species or when they see videos of them. The bite's nasty, and it is a large spider. That said, I've now kept 12 species of Pizzolotheria, and I've been keeping them for years, and I've learned that a lot of what is said out there isn't necessarily true. It's one of the few species or genus of spiders that I would describe as almost regal. They're very shy overall, and I think the temperament-wise, they're not very prone to biting. That's not to say it can't happen. I definitely understand people who are like, well, I'm not even taking the chance. They're not for everybody. I get that. However, for somebody who's got some experience in keeping tarantulas that wants to move up to these guys, I think they're incredibly rewarding and beautiful. The and from personal experience, when folks come over and ask to view my collection, the spiders that tend to get the most attention are my piece of Letharia. There's just something amazing about them. They look different than other spiders. People usually marvel at the fact that they're so large and look so different from what they normally picture tarantulas to be like. Personally, I think it all comes down to respecting the animal, and I think this goes for any species of tarantula you're keeping. Practice good habits, keep your fingers out of the way, work on transfers, and a species like this won't be nearly as threatening because the opportunities for it to become defensive or bite should be slim and none. And here's my piece of Letharia striata, and I'm going to illustrate one last point that's going to be kind of funny, but it isn't mentioned much. These guys can be quite messy. If you notice the side of the enclosure there, that's feces. They tend to like to climb up the side of the enclosure and spray it everywhere. It's an arboreal thing. However, when setting up your tarantula, your piece of Letharia species, it's important to remember that any decoration that you provide it is likely to become caked in feces. And this is just a comical but very real fact of keeping these guys. I see a lot of uh, people will set them up in these gorgeous enclosures, and they do demand that extra attention. They are a showcase spider. But I think sometimes we forget that those fake plants or real plants or backgrounds are eventually going to be basically festooned in poo. So something to consider when setting yours up, that this is one of the few species that I will go in and clean more often every few months or so. This one here, she just molted. Now that she's calmed down, I'm gonna give her a couple crickets, go in there with some water and paper towels and try to clean some of this off. But keep in mind when setting up your enclosure that if you have something with textures, it's gonna be more difficult to clean. So just a heads up and a tip you normally don't see in videos with these guys. So there we are, that concludes this video on one of my favorite genera of tarantulas, probably my favorite piece of Letharia. Hopefully this will help to dispel some of the myths around this species and some of the bad reputation it has for folks that have been eyeing them because it does seem to get around that they're pretty vicious and nasty. I don't think that's the case. This is a tarantula that demands respect and a keeper that is familiar with working with old world species and fast species to limit the possibilities that it would escape or bite. But I think they're also an amazing creature that's actually much more gentle than it's given credit for. So for all of you out there watching the video that keep pokies, please chime in in the comment section. Let me know what your favorite is or some of your pokey stories. I love hearing about them. And for those of you that may be on the fence about getting one or have some questions, please ask away. As much as I endeavor to cover everything I can think of in these videos, there's always something I miss.